Anyways, let's give a warm welcome to Catherine Osmond. Thank you for having me, and thank you for skipping the Republican National Convention tonight to be here. It really means a lot to me that you would sacrifice in this way. Um, it's very special. No, I'm thrilled to be here. I live in Chicago, but my family comes to California every summer for work, and so it just happened I could come here. So what a, a great turn of events. Uh, and I want to talk about my book. My book is um, a combination of personal story and social science research and reporting that I've done for the past, sorry if that's making a weird noise, for the past uh, about three or four years. And it's all just been published last month. So I'm on the road giving talks about it. And Lynn says we don't do readings here. I'm going to do a really short reading. It's only four minutes, I promise. And then I'll talk a lot. And then questions, please. Lots of questions, I hope. So this is the beginning of the book. One night, four years ago, I heard a strange noise outside the window of our brick row house near Boston. We lived across the street from a Greek Orthodox church, a squat stone structure with a domed roof topped by a cross. Just as I was about to go to bed, I heard the sound of muffled padding, like hundreds of shuffling feet growing closer. Mama, my son who is nine, called, come look. I joined him by the window, and together we watched members of the church, elderly, middle-aged, 20-somethings, teenagers, and children, walk en masse up the street, which was closed off to accommodate their passage. They walked silently, each holding a candle, led by a priest in a long robe. Just behind the priest, several men carried an ornate beer covered in fresh flowers and bearing a small doll wrapped in white cloth. As my son and I watched, the procession stopped right in front of our house. Little boys pulled at two tight ties, girls swayed in long skirts, and husbands and wives pressed close to each other in the cool night air. What are they doing, my son asked. It's a ritual, I said, thinking it must be their Good Friday. Well, why don't we do that, he asked. Because we're not Greek Orthodox, I said then what are we? I thought of the candy and trinkets I bought for him and his two younger sisters for Easter every year, the overfilled baskets I placed in their rooms as they slept, and the indoor Easter egg hunts I put together. The only things my children knew about the most sacred holiday in Christianity were colorful plastic eggs and foil-wrapped chocolate bunnies. Even the doll wrapped in white cloth the symbolic baby Jesus was a mystery to them. The priest in his traditional flat-topped hat read a passage aloud in Greek, and the crowd sang a verse in response. After several more exchanges, he turned to the church and walked toward it. The congregants followed him down the street and into the building like a river narrowing through a lock. Turning from the window after the street had emptied, my son persisted. So what are we? I looked at him and felt my face flush. I wrestled with how to answer him, but then blurted out words I'd soon regret. We're nothing, I said. I knew right away that this was a terrible thing to say, and I sensed that I had let him down, not just in that moment, but in a larger, more important way. My inability to find the words to describe us reflected the fact that my husband and I had never created a cohesive narrative for the life we had chosen to live. A narrative that would tie us to a like-minded group via a clear moral framework, meaningful rituals, and a deep sense of belonging. The moment at the window was the culmination of so many other small moments, times when I felt at a loss to describe who we were, what we believe, and where we fit. My son had asked the simplest of questions. What are we? and I couldn't answer him. Why was that? And just skip a little, just a little part and just one more section. My son didn't say anything. He just cocked his head slightly to one side like a small, curious animal. Before I could ask what he thought, he said goodnight and walked upstairs to bed. 
but I couldn't let go so easily. I stood at the window a bit longer, watching the policemen remove the wooden barricades that had been used to close off the street. I decided that I would seek a better answer for my son, for myself, and for my family. Lowering the blind, I turned away from the scene outside and surveyed the room before me. Strewn in all directions were art projects, sports balls, books, backpacks, and newspapers. Somewhere in that cluttered mishmash, somewhere in the very lives that we were living, were values, rituals, and sources of meaning worth naming. I knew that we were something, but what? And that is how this book began, as one woman's search for a better answer to her son's big question. So that is really the moment that I realized I needed to write about this um, thing I thought was only happening to me. <laughs> and I was working at the time for Boston Magazine uh, as a contributing editor, and every so often I had to give my editor a bunch of story ideas. And that month I, I wrote up my story ideas, and I, I put this one at the bottom is losing or um, raising kids without religion does it matter <laughs> or something like that and he got right back to me he'd gone down the list and he said I really want you to write that one because um, so many people are going through this right now he had just had kids and his he had been raised with religion but wasn't raising his own children with religion he wanted to know more about it what is this what is this thing that feels like it's happening to a lot of people so this was in 2012, and I don't know if you all recall, but in November 2012, or maybe it was October, the Pew Foundation came out with some statistics that really surprised people. So as I'm starting to research my story that I think is about me and my friends and my, my editor, you know, uh, the Pew Foundation reveals that 20% of Americans no longer affiliate with any one religion and they call them the nuns. I'm sure you're familiar with this, N-O-N-E-S, which is this umbrella term for people who choose none of the above. Um, atheists, agnostics, spiritual but not religious. Many people who are, you know, pos pos probably believe in God, but they just don't affiliate with a religion anymore. Uh, and so this was happening right as I'm starting to research my story, and I realized maybe this is a bigger story than what I thought. Maybe it wasn't just me in my house with my son wondering these things. I happened to live a tea stop away from Harvard Square, and there were all these great minds there at Harvard University. And one of the greatest on this topic is Robert Putnam, who wrote Bowling Alone, and another book about religion called American Grace. And his whole thesis is that there's this fraying of civic fabric in America because we started bowling alone. We bowl, but we don't bowl in bowling leagues anymore. We now go by ourselves. Um, and we increasingly have these individual experiences. So I, call, I email him, and I begged him basically to, to meet with me. Here I am, just a Boston Magazine writer, and he's this pretty much a social science superstar. And he emailed back the next day, and he said, yeah, let's have coffee. And he later said that he gets 30 or 40 of these requests each week, and he picks one. And this was the one. He really wanted to talk about this topic because he thinks it's so important. And when I met him, these Pew figures had just come out. And even he, who studies this, was in shock. He said, you cannot overstate how big this is for as long as they've studied religious affiliation in the US, that number has hovered at 7%. So for decades, you've got it just kind of chugging along at 7%. Starting in 1990, it starts to go up slowly, but it does start to go up. Uh, and now we're at this 20% this 20, 20%. Well, since then, in just four years, it's now almost 25%. So it's a continuing change, and it's happening. You know, people always say, well, it's not happening everywhere. It is happening everywhere, not to that degree, but the nuns are the only group growing in all 50 states, if you look at religious affiliation. So it is really happening, even in the Bible Belt. Um, people are leaving behind the identity, maybe not the belief, but they're definitely leaving behind a lot of the behaviors and a lot of the um, things that go with affiliation. So he explained to me it's like a hockey stick. He said, the graph looks like a hockey stick. It's just 
going like this, and then it starts to go up. And it starts to go up the year I graduated from college, in 1990. So I get really curious about this curve here. What's happening? <laughs> Why are all these people starting to leave? Um, so many of the people I started to write about were raised with religion, and most nuns were raised with some kind of religious background, um, but they're not raising their kids that way. And so this is a, a, a big change. And the other thing is that often people will leave religion um, when they go to college, but then they come back around once they marry and start having kids. That's not happening anymore either. So this is a real shift in our country, and I wanted to know what was going on with this group right here. So I asked Putnam, and I did some research, and one of the primary explanations for this is that we had the the counterculture of the 1960s, which shook everything up, and we challenged our institutional ways and mores. And the backlash to that was Jerry Falwell and the moral majority. And suddenly, we have politics entering the pulpit. And there is, um, you know, I remember in my town anyway, there were a lot of bumper stickers. Uh, that said, the moral majority is neither. I don't know if you guys saw those. But uh, there was this whole um, sense that something was happening in the 70s and 80s that religion was changing. And so people were feeling like if religion is about birth control and abortion clinics and uh, you know who you're supposed to marry, that's really not what I go to church for. And so I'm going to just start to remove myself from that. And we've seen an increase in that, of just removing from the institution. That's really the big change. It's, we now have 23% of Americans are nuns. But if you look only at adult millennials, it's 35%. So you can see this is just going um, through the generations. It's really increasing. And what happens is, when you have kids like I do, and I'm not raising them with any religion at all, is that then they don't have anything to pass on to their kids. And so there's, for, for as long as people have studied secularization, there's been the secularization thesis. Some of you may know this. It's that as societies modernize, they also secularize. And there's been one country that has disproved that thesis all these years, which is the United States. We are such a religious place. Um, and there's new research that just came out in April. And it shows that, in fact, this trend, when you can see it in the millennials and my generation and younger, um, this trend of generational replacement where people are starting to um, sort of slowly back out of any of the three sort of areas of religious um, sort of uh, a religious identity includes belief, behavior, and belonging. And so as people lose one, they'll start to lose the others. So as you start to disaffiliate, you'll stop you know, doing some of the other aspects of the religious practice. So they're showing now, this paper, that in fact the U.S now proves the secularization thesis. That, in fact, we are secularizing in much the same way that many European countries have. But we're doing it in a, it, we've just done it at a different pace, and different societal factors have come in, and one of them being the 60s. Um, so that, that, was, that was really interesting. I got into this sort of the, the heart of what's going on, of why people are, are leaving religion. Uh, I interviewed a variety of professors, and I wrote my article. And I went to a meeting somewhat like this. Um, it was the Greater Boston Atheist Community after my article came out to talk about raising ethical kids. And at the end of my talk, which was basically a summary of my article, a guy raised his hand and he said, OK, I get it. We're leaving religion, and, and I have too. But I have kids, and I, we don't know where to take them to escape um, the rat race of our lives, the school and the sports and the work and the, the consumer forces that are constantly trying to get them to buy things and play video games. And um, what, what do we do? <laughs> and I realized I, didn't, I hadn't gone that far. I hadn't found an answer for his question. My, my story was really about 
the change. And so the book um, was a continuation of the story. And what I did was I went around the country and I interviewed people in groups like this one and a whole variety of, of groups to figure out how people are replacing those things that religion is known to have given people. And I'm talking about the, the good things. Um, so community, um, which includes identity and belonging, um, rituals to mark time and to to create a sense of um, importance over different rites of passage that we go through. Um, I talked about shared stories and how those create a heritage um, that people can tap into, again, for an identity, for a sense of, of who they are and where they come from, and also meaning and purpose. And so the, very, the first part of the book really looks at how religion has done that and how it's really become this well-oiled machine. One thing about the religions that are in existence today is they are very finely honed or they wouldn't be here. They've survived. Survival of the fittest applied to religion. Um, and so they're really good at what they're doing. I mean, they really can galvanize people to good or bad, right? Um, and so the question I had for the bulk of the book was can secular people provide those things? And if so, who, what are the most interesting things I'm out there that are, that are happening? And so the book brought me to a, a lot of different places. It brought me to um, a secular, nature-based coming-of-age ceremony uh, in Marin County. It's at the Green Gulch Zen Farm, which of course is Zen, but it's, um, it's a little separate from the Zen Buddhist tradition. It's more of a a nature-based activity where parents who want their kids to have, you know, they don't want to do a bar mitzvah or confirmation or one of those traditionally religious activities, they can enroll their kids in this year-long practice and they study each month a different value. And by the end, they have this beautiful ceremony that I attended um, where they state um, what it is they want to give to the world who they are and what they plan to give to the world. And it was this really lovely way to ritualize um, uh, not just coming of age, but sort of trying to get kids to think about what, what do they give back, right? So it's not just about Pokemon Go and <laughs> whatever the kids are doing. It's also about right, what are the values we're trying to inculcate. So that was a great one. Um, I spent a fair amount of time with the Harvard Humanist Community in Cambridge because I lived right there. And they have a full um, array of activities. They have book clubs. They have a secular, they call it a secular Sunday school. Um, although maybe they call it a learning lab now. It's just been funded by E.O. Wilson, and it's going to be this really um, great program for kids of all ages, also including coming of age um, ceremonies, and just exploring humanist um, values and ideas about science and, and how to think about the world. Uh, and I visited a storytelling group in Oregon where people stand on stage and share a story about their life. Um, that each It's once a, a quarter, so they do this four times a year. And there's a theme, and each, um, each theme or each meeting, about eight people get up and they share a story and then there is this sort of these satellite communities of storytelling groups that go on um, in between this, these bigger meetings. All of these, and there were so many more, you know, and there's atheist groups like this one. I went to the American Atheist Convention in Memphis. Um, I attended um, some workshops uh, with a woman who runs Grief Beyond Belief. She's also in this area. To talk, I talked with humanist chaplains about how they guide people through um, grief and loss when they don't believe in God. And what I found was this sort of exciting thing. Uh, you know, those of you who have been at this longer probably will say, well, we've been doing this all along. For me, it was a discovery. And I think for a lot of families, it's um, an urgent need that they have. And it seems to me, from the research I did, that groups like this one are starting to open up more to families. And people are trying to bring in sort of all the age groups, kind of like religions do, right? They're like a one-stop shop for so many different things. And so the book really ends by showing um, how we can meet all of these needs in our secular lives. 
And one of the questions I asked um, Bob Putnam when I was meeting with him, at the time I was, I was just learning about the Harvard humanist community, and I said, so do you think in, you know, in time, since we're all leaving religion, that eventually we'll just all be going to these humanist communities <laughs> instead? And he said, you know, we won't know for 300 years. Um, which I took to be sort of a theme in the book is that this is so slowly evolving that we're at the very beginning of it, sort of pioneers at the beginning of trying to set up community that is, um, has all the good of religion without the bad of it, um, if that's possible. <laughs> um, and so that was, um, that was, I thought, hopeful in a way, because it means that the creative spirit is needed now more than ever. And so for people like this group, which has this wonderful turnout, um, I just, I see this growing more and more. And I'd, I'd actually like to hear more later during questions about the challenges that you find with that. Um, there have been some studies that show that it is harder to keep a secular group together over a longer period of time than a religious group. Um, it's that that God thing because <laughs> really motivates people to come together and follow the rules. And um, again, this finely honed machine that uses ritual and collective um, experience to bring people together is, is very galvanizing. And so how do we get some of that in our secular lives? For me as a parent, um, one of the more important things is community service, which, you know, the studies show that the religious are better at this, not just in their religious groups, but also in their civic or, uh, communities. And so how do we get our kids to think um, about something bigger than themselves? And I think that was some of what my son was sensing that day when he was watching this ritual. There was something about that that was... Um, he had never experienced, you know. My kids have been in church once for a family wedding, and they complained the whole time. And I, I, it was hot and it was boring, and I was just the whole time just shushing them. And you know, I had grown up in in church. I was I was raised Presbyterian. My husband was raised Jewish, and uh, so we've had that experience of having to sit still and listen to the the minister and, and do as you're told. And sometimes I do worry that my kids are not getting that, except maybe in school, but that's a lot, I think, to put on a school. So in the end, when my son, uh, people ask, so what do you tell your son now? You know, you went out and you wrote this book and you spent four years researching and talking to people. And I ended the book with an epilogue, which is a letter to him and my two daughters. And it's a listing of the things that I value and believe that I hope that he will at least consider as he seeks to make a meaningful life for himself. Um, and I think it was the articulation of those values that was the real need in that moment when he said, what are we? Instead of just saying, oh, we're nothing, uh, it's too complicated, I can't answer that question, um, to kind of say, you know what, it's a complicated question and I'm going to answer it anyway. And that's really um, what this book is, is an articulation of a, a sort of a secular worldview that is full of meaning and full of purpose and connection. Um, and grace, and people have criticized the title of the book. They'll say, how can you have grace without God? But I actually, one of the arguments in the book is that um, religion has been dominant for so long that these profound human experiences are all couched in religious terms. We just have inherited the language. And in fact, grace, to me, is a feeling of gratitude, of being grateful for being alive and filled with wonder about that. And so I'm trying to wrest some of these terms from the religious um, world and bring it into sort of um, a, a secular realm as well. And so that also is a way that I explain to my kids when they ask what we are and what I believe. Um, it's, a, it's a full embrace of secular meaning and wonder and finding grace without God. 
And so that is sort of my book in a nutshell, but I am really happy to answer any questions or hear any comments you have about your own efforts at secular community building here in San Jose. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All righty, so if you guys have any questions, we have a mic set up here, just come on up and uh, ask any questions that may come, and uh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> I, I didn't get the name of the uh, program you said for the kids who... Oh, the one at Green Gulch? Uh, the, yeah. It, the, where they came out and said yeah, what their values right. are. Right. That's, for. in fact, I have some flyers here, but that's called the Green Gulch Coming of Age Program at the Green Gulch Farm in Marin County. Right, yeah. Hi. Uh, excellent talk. Thanks. Um, one of the things that I sort of am struggling with is a lot of people think that you can only get morality from religion. And um, I'm starting to come to an idea that maybe we should start having morality classes in elementary school. Right. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that and what you think other yeah. people would think about that. Yeah, this is a problem, right? The stigma of not being religious. That's the one thing people always say. They'll say, how can you have meaning without God? And how can you be a, have morality without God? Um, I think that's changing very slowly. I think the research on um, that stigma and, and sort of the acceptability of atheists is starting to show some slow change. Um, for instance, this, you know, you always hear that Americans, the, the least likely person that Americans would ever elect president would be an atheist. Well, that's starting to change a little bit. The statistics are starting to get a little bit better. Um, I see it as sort of the gay rights movement where people start to, um, there'll be a turning point where people will be like, oh, yeah, my, my friend Chuck is an atheist and he's a nice guy, so, you know, what, what's the big deal? I think that eventually that will sort of, become more normal. But in terms of kids and morality, um, I think it's a real problem because people do have that, that belief. And, you know, in fact, I met one mother in Minnesota who does a secular Sunday school at her kitchen table every Sunday with her, her family. She's got three kids and her husband's there too. And I asked her why she started it. And she said, I started it because the kids they live in a very rural town. And she said the kids at my daughter's school said they were going to hell because they don't believe in God. And so she's trying to teach them real morality. Do you know what I mean? Like she's trying to teach them acceptance and her values um, are not the same as the families that are teaching their kids to say that. Um, I, don't, I don't know an answer, but I do think that one thing schools, you know, schools are really burdened in this country with so many things. And if we, what's nice about communities that, like this, that have, you know, options for kids, is to have that accountability and have the like-minded people around reinforcing values. So many of us end up kind of in our own individual world, just shuttling our kids to and from sports. And so if schools are too busy and parents are too busy, we've got to find a place to do it. And we try to do it. I mean, we really do work on our kids to try to get them very involved in the local neighborhood charity. Um, but it's a lot of effort. So, but I agree. I think a class on ethics starting early on or moral reasoning would be really great for kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if, see, I only have my experience in a couple of groups that I've been around. As you've gone around the country, do you find in general more similarities or differences between atheists and humanists? Because both of them mm -hmm. don't believe in God, but right. they have different 
uh, emphasis? I find more similarities, I'd have to say. I mean, I would, um, yeah, I would think, I think that there's a common denominator there, right? There's this idea that we are good without God and we are, um, you know, there's there's these secular values that I think cross over in both in both realms. But um, it seems that the humanist groups that I've seen mm. have more of the community building oh, things, yeah. and yeah. the atheists tend more towards the what individualistic. That could be. That could be. I mean, I haven't done research on that specifically. That's actually a really good question. Some of the atheist groups I, I went and visited were smaller, and they didn't have as many options for families or people with young children. And so it def definitely had a different flavor, almost more of um, a feeling of a lecture than a full experience. And so, you know, and then there's also the Sunday assemblies, which have they're all different. You know, I went to one in Boston that was all adults, and then I visited one in San Diego that had a lot of kid activities and it was much bigger. And so those are all different. I think it's so new that it's almost hard to say. I wouldn't want to say without real statistics. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Mind you. Oh, what's up? So, uh, in your traveling around the U.S., were there any areas where you found um, more atheists than that, mm. that surprised you? Areas where you would not think there would be as many? Mm. And I'm just kind of curious about how what the whole yeah. experience was like. Well, you know, when I was in Memphis at the atheist um, conference, American Atheist Conference, I think it was last April. Um, or maybe two Aprils ago, there was a whole workshop on being an atheist in the South. And it was great. Neil Carter, who's the Godless and Dixie blogger, and a few others, I can't remember all their names. Uh, and they talked, in the, so the whole room, it drew all these Southern atheists. So it was all, and they were all kind of leaders in their town. And um, I think those conventions, where I came to realize, those are a real um, wonderful thing for people who are kind of isolated, because everyone in that room was like, I'm the only one, or we don't have that many people, and what do we, what do, we do when we get together? There's only five of us. Um, and so these, I met people that go to all the conventions. They sign up for all the, and they're almost like a rock tour, like they go around the country whenever there's something. And this is a couple from Kansas, and they really wanted to be with their people, but their people were not in their town, and so they had to go on the road. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think um, one saving grace for a lot of people is the internet. They can connect with people online, and they, if, especially if it's not safe for them to be atheists in their community, which for a lot of these people they're not, which boggles the mind. Um, they can connect on the internet and set up, you know, chats and things like that. Um, I think the thing I was most struck by from that was how lonely it can be if you live in a very religious place and how you could never have this many people in a room. That'll change, right? But I think for some of these people in small towns in the Deep South, that's really hard. One thing that struck me at the beginning of your speech, you're yeah. talking about the hockey stick, oh, yeah. um, and you laid it down, possibly, to, to the counterculture right. of the 60s, but 1990 is close to the time when the internet started taking off. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider that it could be the internet was the main driving force? I've heard that. I've heard air conditioning. I've heard <laughs> <laughs> there's studies on everything, and so you have to kind of pick and choose. But I, I think there's a lot of different ways to explain it. I mean, the secularization thesis um, just mainly says, as secular institutions come to replace religious ones, we don't need it as much. And I certainly feel that. So my grandmother um, was from very small town, Arkansas, and she was deeply, devoutly religious. She was an elder in the church. She was a missionary. She went to Guyana. Um, Church was a support for her. Her husband died um, when she was 
probably in her 40s, and she had four children, and church was there for her. So I think, you know, I'm trying to think, well, I feel like um, I live in a university town in Chicago. I feel like we would turn to the university community, but we, we don't turn to the church anymore. We have these other institutions. And so, um, yeah, people are finding it in different ways. Yeah. One interesting thing about those numbers of the nuns is, um, and it's actually a little bit disturbing, the evangelical, white evangelical Christians and nuns are about the same share of the population. So they're close to 24% each. A, a few more evangelicals than nuns. But the evangelicals vote at twice the rate mm -hmm. as the nuns do. And so we've got this presidential election and everyone's wondering, you know, are, are these, this, this new group of people that's supposedly taking over the country, are they actually going to show up and make a difference? And I think that gets to the heart of how do you come together? How do people who have left institutions for whatever reason, you know, um, how do they motivate themselves and galvanize themselves to, to make real change in, in the political process? So something to think about. Uh, thanks for coming to speak sure. to our group tonight. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how familiar you are with, uh, let's say, in the closet atheists who are still going to church right. just to, for whatever reason, it might be because their family is still going and mm -hmm. they don't want to break things up. Right. Uh, they've got a community for their children. Mm -hmm. And so what's really the harm in continuing to go to church in that capacity, just so you have the community. Mm -hmm. um, I know you get into the issue of, well, your kids, if you tell them it is a fairy tale, right. that they're going to talk to the other Christian mm -hmm. kids, mm -hmm. and then they'll be told, no, you'll go to hell, and mm -hmm. they'll say, no, you know, you're right. wrong. Right. You get situations like that, but if you let your kids know you don't talk about it, mm -hmm. just it is a fairy tale, um, so I was wondering uh, what you can say about that mm -hmm. and what you know about that. Yeah, well, I know there's the, the clergy project, which is for religious leaders who no longer believe in God. And so many of them struggle because this is their livelihood and their community. I met a number of people who lost their whole community when they came out as atheists. And I thought that was so sad. Um, people whose marriages were ruined, everything just blew up. Um, so I would never fault anyone for not wanting, you know, that to happen. I think it, it just depends on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess. But I think it's, I think, you know, I don't know the, ex I know there are statistics on this. There are statistics about how many non-believers are at church, and probably someone in this room may know that, but I don't know exactly what that is, but I think it's somewhat common. And I think people say, and I mean a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I don't believe any of that, but I like to sing with a big group of people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they like the rituals, and so they kind of hold their nose and go to it. And so when I met Greg Epstein, who runs the Harvard Humanist Community, he said, we want to provide a place where you don't have to hold your nose. You can come here and you can do a lot of that stuff, um, but you don't have to profess a belief that, that you don't have. So I think in time, as people see that those are more available options, maybe they'll find their way to that. But so I don't judge anybody for, for doing that. Along those same lines, do you feel that the statistics might be a little bit skewed, mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people who are still in the closet and are even afraid to mark the yeah. box, none? Yeah. I think that's really true. I think especially because religion is so dominant and it's sort of the norm. I mean, I know I've had this experience. I've gone to the hospital um, when having my kids and you have to check a box because in case you die and do you need the last rites of done or whatever. And I've checked nothing and it felt strange to me having grown up as a Christian even me, you know, and so I think that a lot of people struggle with that because it's just been the norm for so long, and so I think that is starting to change. That will not be a problem for my kids. My daughter, who's 10, says, I'm part Jewish, part Christian, and part gymnastics, so she's developed her own identity completely whole cloth, so yeah. I'd like to comment on the passage you read at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, we, 
if the question is why don't we do that ritual, yeah. the answer should not be because we are not right. such and such. It's just explaining a way by applying a label. Right. The better answer, uh, a better answer would be because we don't find it necessary or entertaining. Right. And then kind of there are no more questions. Well, interesting, because one of the real struggles I had with writing this book is all of these themes are intertwined. The ritual is a part of the identity, and the identity is a part of the belief. And it's all, and so the, the struggle of this book and why it took me three or four years and not one or two was teasing out the themes and trying to separate them, because in that scene is everything about religion good and bad. So then, I should tell you, a couple of years later, we were watching, and my daughter, the one who's part gymnastics, was watching, and she said, how come there's no girls holding the candles up front? Uh -huh. So, they, you know, all of it was encased in that scene right there, so. So, so perhaps I missed this, but how are your kids doing now? Um, they seem to. You know, they how old are they great. now? And I'm <laughs> yeah. sure your, your son has some sort of memory of this because yeah. it sounds pretty important. What, what's going on now? Yeah, so my son is 13, and um, my daughters are 10 and 6. And they are uh, very, I think what's changed, and I think what is a struggle for a lot of secular parents is you sort of don't want to address the elephant in the room because you don't want to proselytize your non-belief to your kids. You want that to all be open and they'll figure it out on their own. Well, I realized they needed some, they needed to know what I believed and to know that they can believe something else. And so when we talk about, you know, they ask me, and I talk about this in the book, again, the themes, but what happens when we die, you know, who was the mother of the first person? <laughs> You know, like, they ask all these big questions all the time. And um, instead of shunting them off and saying, you know, oh, I don't, I don't know because, you know, as a secular person, I don't really, you know, have thoughts about that. Like, I really go in there and we wrestle with it and we talk. And so it's all um, become a big exploration. And, I, you know, they, they're making it up with some guidance, but my daughter is telling me what she is. She's developed this identity. And uh, my, our little one, <laughs> who was, when she was three, we were at a garden store, and I was picking out a Christmas wreath for the front door, and she went over to where the statues were, and she found an angel who was kneeling and had her hands clasped in prayer. And she said, Mama, look, that girl is doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, that's not a yogi, that's, a, that's an angel. And she said, what's an angel? And so we talk about all this stuff now. What's an angel? Well, I'll, I'll say, this is an angel, and you know, your grandmother really was way into angels, and she thinks she's, you know, was going to become an angel when she died, and all that. You know, we really, I talk about it, um, very openly, and I think that's been the big difference. And it's become a really rich vein of discussion in our house. There's this fellow named Robin Sylvan, who's a uh. author of a couple books. He lives in the East Bay here. Mm. The books are about the idea that, uh, that modern music, particularly raves uh -huh. and rock concerts, but it could be a wider variety of, of music is, is the modern secular ritual. Mm -hmm. You've heard this, perhaps. No, but I've heard it about football games <laughs> 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 and other things like that. So uh, the point is, of course, that uh, there's modern rituals that take place that are secular right. outside the, what we consider to be religious, mm -hmm. but they, they function in the same way mm -hmm. at various levels. And so I just wanted right. to mention that. Yeah, and these giant collective rituals, I think, are people, that's what a lot of people said they missed because they're doing small rites of passage uh, with their families, but people really miss singing collectively in a church and the sound of that, you know? And so there are these other places people kind of gravitate to different forms of meaning and, and collective experience. So I grew up as a campfire girl, 
Mm -hmm. And that was way more important to me than church ever was. Right. And there is such a thing as a secular scouts. I mean, oh. there was at a time, I don't know if there still is, mm -hmm. but that format, mm -hmm. which is adults and kids together with a focus on nature, but that's you know kind of mm -hmm. sort of peripheral, is a perfect way mm -hmm. to communicate values from one generation to the next. Right. And it's fun. Um, and you do, you sing together, you go for walks together, you learn all kinds of interesting things together right and why are we not exploiting that kind of format and that kind of group and it doesn't have to be parent child mm -hmm. that's a great idea because one of the things and one of the things from that scene that i read was it was this intergenerational group it was you know the elderly all the way down to the babies all together every week you know um and I thought that, that there's something really nice about that. In our, in our lives, our kids are in school with kids their own age, and then they're in sports with kids their own age, and then they're home with us telling them to do their homework. And so where do we get that meaning? And I do think that you're onto something, too, with nature, because I think a lot of um, the people I talked with, and there are some research that shows, if you live closer to uh, nat nature and, and parks where you can go explore, you're less likely to be religiously affiliated. It's hard to do a direct cause effect on that, but there's some suggestion that people are getting their spiritual sort of, um, you know, whatever it, it is they're looking for from being out in nature. And so doing that with kids and in a group is, I think, a really great idea. And there are right, right. Well, and one thing I've investigated and I wrote about was... Um, the solstice celebrations are a big deal right now. People are celebrating, taking solstice as their holiday celebration instead of Christmas. And so I read about one in New York City with a bunch of, you know, probably 300 people came together to do this, this ritual to um, mark the passage of time and, and the, the changing of the seasons and the light. And it was really amazing. And so I've, I've seen more and more of almost uh, getting back to the earth as the place where we can sort of come together, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we have time for one more if anyone wants to come up for one more. OK, great. Well, two things. I'm. Uh, with the humanist community okay. in Silicon Valley. Uh -huh. And I want to say that as far as I know, we're all atheists. I don't right. know why people don't know that. I think people <laughs> would be pretty uncomfortable if they weren't atheists. Yeah. Um, but it might be because we don't talk about it very much. Right. Uh, we have a lot, quite a variety. We have, we have a speaker every Sunday morning, a nice buffet after it. We have a little Sunday school. Or we have, we have recently uh, about, a year and a half ago, rented a 24-7 uh, location, which as far as I know, is the only one of a secular group in the area. Hmm. Um, and it's open to other groups to come and use it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope they will, because we're really underused. Uh -huh. And it's a nice location. Everything mm -hmm. is all new. They, they, they completely redid the space for us, uh -huh. and everything is new. <laughs> and yeah. we, we really would welcome people to come. That's great. And um, oh, there was something else that was mentioned, but um, I don't remember what that was. <laughs> we, we have we celebrated the solstice for many years, and I guess mm -hmm. what I wanted to say was Christmas is stolen from the solstice. It's right. really the right. solstice they're celebrating, yeah. even though the date has drifted. Right. And uh, so it only makes sense to go back to the source, mm -hmm. which is the sun and the seasons, mm -hmm. and celebrate that instead of this mm -hmm. phony <laughs> birth by the... <laughs> The Christian thing is just like all the pagan things before right. it was a virgin birth and all of this stuff. And it makes sense to sh sh shed all that. Yes. And go right back to the earth and, the, and our part in it and how important it is to us. I agree. And I think that part of the argument in the book is just peeling back that layer of religion that overlays just human experience that we're all after, right? Is connection and meaning. Um, and about the labels, uh, a lot of people I met really don't like any labels. They, they, they say they're too complicated for a label. So I had someone who said she's a Buddhist, 
agnostic with atheistic tendencies. That's her label, okay? <laughs> and so this whole idea of the nuns is really, um, it's an umbrella term that got slapped on because it's really kind of covering a really complex thing that a lot of people are wrestling with. How do you, how do you describe yourself in this age? It's, it's com more complicated, I think. Yeah. All right, everyone, let's uh, give Catherine a Thank you. Okay.